Okay, so this was the procedure. And now let's prove that this procedure actually controls for the FDR. So we have to make one assumption. We are assuming that the hypotheses are independent. If you want to get uh, a little bit of a nitpicking, then we are only assuming that the null hypotheses are independent and that the whole null hypothesis are independent as a group from the uh, non-null hypothesis. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, we, the theorem states that if we assume this, then the benjamini hochberg procedure controls the FDR. And it actually controls the FDR by the proportion M0 divided by M, where M0 is the number of null hypothesis. But since in reality, we don't know this quantity, then what matters for us is that this quantity is less than or equal than one, which means that this whole quantity is less or equal than Q star, which means that this procedure actually controls the FDR with the uh, Q star. Okay, so let's prove this. This proof is not the one uh, in the original paper, it's a different proof. Uh, let's denote by K the largest I, such that uh, P uh, ordered I is less or equal than I divided by M times Q star. So basically we ran the, the benjamini hochberg procedure and uh, K is the index where it's the cutoff index. So everything up to including K we reject. Now notice that if we run the benjamini hochberg procedure, then our R, yeah, the R here, is already known. It's not an unknown quantity. We know the R and R is equal to K because this is what we reject. Yeah, So R is equal to K. And if we denote by PI the random variable whose results are the observed P values, then let's see what's the FDR is. Let's start developing the FDR. The FDR is the expectation of V divided by R. But again, R is already known. It's K. And what is V? Well, V is the sum over all of the null hypothesis. Yeah, times an indicator variable, which means, did we reject that uh, null hypothesis? Did the p-value that we got for this null hypothesis were less than what was the cutoff value, meaning we rejected it? So we made a mistake, yeah? We rejected uh, a null hypothesis, even though it was true. Yeah, and you can think, I, I put a, a graph here. Yeah, you can see this is the last, this is the graph of, I divided by M times 0 0.05, okay? This is the graph. And we can see that the last index that actually is below it is here. So the cutoff value will be, yeah, this cutoff value, somewhere along 0 0.4, okay? But it could be that some of these uh, P values, some of these hypotheses were, were actually null. So it could be that this, this p-value is actually belonging to a null hypothesis that we actually rejected, we actually falsely rejected, okay? So this indicator variable is actually saying uh, it gets zero for all of these, yeah, because all of these are below the cutoff values, but they are actually, uh, let's say, uh, not null. But for this, which is null, it is below the cutoff value, but it's null, so it will get one. So it will count all the mistakes that we made. Yeah, so this is why this is equal to this. And we can take the sum outside and get this. Okay, so now since the p-values are independent from one another, uh, it's sufficient to show that for each one of those, they are below Q star divided by M. And since then we sum over all of the null hypothesis, we just uh, this sum will be less than M0 divided by M times Q star. Okay, so without loss of generality, let's assume that the first index, yeah, the P1, is actually in H0. And let's prove that for, let's prove this for P1, yeah? We could have chose any other P, but for sake of simplicity, let's choose P1 and let's assume that it's actually in H0. And another thing we can do is we can condition on all the other values. So we are trying to prove this for P1, but we can add the given all of this. And why we can do this? Well, because if we prove this by the law of total expectation, we can just take the expectation with regards to all of this value. But since this will give us just this, yeah? But since if we'll take the expectation here, we will get this. And if we take the expectation here, this is a constant. So we'll just get that constant. So it's enough to just 
prove this. Okay, so what do we do now? We reorder all of the remaining values, P2 to PM, uh, and we also relabel them so that they are actually, P2 is actually the uh, lowest one disregarding P1, and PM is the largest p-value disregarding P1. And note that P1 is not necessarily less or equal than P2. Yeah, we just took one of the p-values at random, we took it out, and now we are reordering all the rest. We are denoting by J the argmax okay, of R that goes from 2 to M of all these p-values that are less or equal than R uh, divided by M times Q star. Okay, so this looks a lot like Benjamin Ochberg, uh, but it's kind of, it's not Benjamin Ochberg on M minus one, yeah? Because look, R is only going from two to M, yeah? So it's not the same as if you would do this on M minus one. If you would do this on M minus one, you would have to divide by M minus one. You will have to go from one till M minus one. This is not what it is. What, what is it, okay? So, okay, let's say this was the cutoff value, yeah? And now it could be that we took this point, yeah, this was P1 and we made it disappear. Yeah, we took it away. What did it do? What will J do? Well, it will take all these, we, re we will rearrange all of the P values. And before this was one and this was two and this was three, but now this is, will go to two and this will go to three. So we are basically, we are, shifting all the points by one up to this point that we actually took off, yeah, if we took it off. So all of these points will go here, okay? But what would happen if we took, let's say, yeah, what would happen if we took this out, okay? If we took this out, then we would also shift this and this and this and this and this and this. And this, and maybe we shifted this to be below the line. And if it's below the line, then it's already, we, have, we will have a new cutoff, okay? So this is the procedure that we are doing. It's kind of equivalent to doing Benjamin e. Hochberg and assuming that the missing p-value is lower than the cutoff value. And actually, if what we took off was this point, yeah, if what we took off was only this point, then we don't shift any of the other points and actually, it's really equivalent and J's will be equal to K. Okay, and so um, these are the two claims I want to make about J. First, that K will always be less or equal to J. Yeah, remember K is what we did with the original Benjamin e. Hochberg and K gives us basically some cut cutoff value. Yeah, it gives us this, okay? So if we do, if we take one point and we take it off and we look at J, then if that point was somewhere over here, before the cutoff value, then it doesn't matter because we will shift all the points before it, but after that, we don't shift any point and the cutoff value stays the same. If it's above, if it's somewhere here, let's say if it's this point, then it could be that we move the point and now it's below the line. And so now we have a new cutoff, okay? So these are the two claims. This is why claim one is that K has to be less or equal to J because J can only be bigger. And the second claim is that if P is less than the cutoff value, then K is equal to J. And actually it doesn't only have to be this cutoff. Yeah. It will also be true for the new cutoff. Yeah. So if P, let's say we took this off. Yeah. Then yeah, maybe we brought this here and now we have a new cutoff and the new cutoff is somewhere here. Yeah. But the point we took off. Yeah. It has to be bigger than the point that we, uh, that is the new cutoff value, yeah? So we can replace uh, here instead of K, we can replace it with J, yeah? Because, yeah, because for all the points that will be below K divided by M Q star, they will also be below J divided by M Q star. Okay, so these are two claims. You, there, there are formal proofs for them, but they are a bit uh, more tricky. So I, I think the graph uh, presentation really explains why these two claims are true. And so let's take them to be true and continue. So looking back to our quantity over here, yeah, we can basically uh, say that this quantity is, e we can replace the K with a J, yeah? We can take the K and replace it with a J. Why is that? Well, 
remember, if P1 uh, is actually greater than this, yeah, then since J is bigger than K, then it must be that P1 is also greater than K, yeah, because here uh, we are, this is greater, the numerator is greater. So if we take an even smaller number, P1 will definitely be bigger than this. And so the indicator function in both cases will be zero, right? Because yeah, P1 is uh, greater than J, so this will be zero, yeah? And if it's greater than J, then P1 has to be greater than K, then this is also zero and zero is equal to zero. Okay, and if it's not, if P1 is actually less than J divided by M times Q star, then we just said that K is equal to J. And in that case, we again get the equality. So all of this is just so that I can replace K with a J. So let's say we take this and we replace it with a J. And now given P2 to PM, yeah, remember J only looked at P2 to PM and given uh, that we have them, then J is already a constant, yeah? And if we are conditioning on P2 to PM, J is a constant. So we can take it out, yeah? We can take uh, one over J out, and we are left with the expectation of an indicator variable, and expectation of indicator variable is probability. Uh, and so we are left with this expression over here. And again, we assumed independence. So P1 is independent of all the other, so it doesn't matter anymore what are these values. So this becomes just this. And again, P1 is, we assumed it's from the null hypothesis. So it's um, a random variable that distributes uniformly. So we just get this quantity over here. Yeah. So we get one over J times this quantity. And in the end, we get Q star divided by M and we finished. Yeah, we wanted to show that this is divided by M. Now we can take the second expectation given all of this, and it will still be less than, uh, and we basically proved this. And now we can take the sum of this, and we got that this is less or equal than M0 divided by M times Q star, and this is less than Q star. Okay, I know it's long, uh, but I hope you, I managed to give you the intuition of why the Benjamini Hofer actually controls the FDR. Now notice that one of the assumptions we had to make is that the hypotheses are independent of one another. This is sometimes non-realistic, but there are some corrections that you can make to uh, make, make the uh, a much a little bit stricter Q, and then uh, uh, you will control even if they are not independent. Okay, so you can instead of Q star, you can take Q uh, dash, uh, and which will be Q star divided by the log of n plus this quantity. Let's switch into R. 